students today we will learn a method called the dual simplex method this method is a modification of the simplex method for a particular type of problem that is which has a relationship with the dual so as in how we proceed we will see how the dual simplex method can be applied to obtain the solution of a linear programming problem. The outline of today's lecture is as follows background, then the dual simplex method with the help of an exercise and finally, a question for you to solve. Now, let us look at the definition of the primal and the dual once again. As you know that if the primal is in the form of minimization of the objective function subject to the inequality constraints of the type greater than or equal to and the dual is of the maximization type and the constraints are of the less than equal to type then the standard form of the primal can be written as minimization of f x which is equal to summation c j x j subject to summation a i j x j greater than or equal to b j where i goes from 1 to up to m and x j are the decision variables of the primal they are greater than or equal to 0 for j is equal to 1 to up to n and the corresponding dual is maximization of a function w y which is equal to summation of b i y i subject to summation a i j y i less than or equal to c j where j goes to 1 to n and the decision variables of the dual are y i are greater than or equal to 0 for i is equal to 1 to up to m. Now, suppose all the c's that is the c j's are greater than or equal to 0 and the b i's are less than or equal to 0. This is a special case we are assuming a special case then the basis consisting of the basic variables that is x n plus 1 x m plus 2 up to x n plus m which are nothing but the slack variables is feasible and also optimum. Similarly, the corresponding basis of the dual is feasible and also optimum. Now, suppose there is a situation that some or all of the b i's are strictly greater than 0, not greater than equal to, they are strictly greater than 0 and all the c j's are greater than or equal to 0, then the basis x m plus 1, x m plus 2, x n plus m is not feasible for the primal, but the basis y m plus 1, y m plus 2 and y m plus n is feasible for the dual. Now, this will hold only if some or all the b i's are strictly greater than 0 this kind of a special situation is called primal infeasible and dual feasible. This is called primal infeasible and dual feasible. Now, suppose we start our calculations of the simplex algorithm on the dual, then we shall be moving 
through a successive uh, iterations uh, where the basic feasible solution of the dual which occurs at the basic variables which means that the cj's are greater than or equal to 0 till uh, the final relative cost coefficient or the deviation coefficients that is the b i's of the dual are all non positive then we would have then arrived in the optimal solution of the dual. So, this is a special situation and under this condition we would have arrived at the optimal solution of the dual. We can get the optimum basis of the primal from the optimal basis of the dual. Therefore, it is possible to abridge this procedure by applying a slightly modified version of the simplex algorithm to the primal table itself. Whereas, we start with a non feasible basic solution of an LP which, uh, which with non negative cost coefficients and this kind of a procedure is termed as the dual simplex method. So, basically uh, in the dual simplex method we are starting from a infeasible solution which is optimum and at the successive iterations we are going towards optimality and feasibility both. So, let us write the simplex table for the primal with the basis consisting of the slack variables. Now, this can be written in this tabular form on the first column we have the basis then in the second column we have the right hand side and under every column x 1, x 2, x 3 etcetera we have their corresponding entries and in the end we have the basis that is x n plus 1, x n plus 2, x n plus m. So, these entries are the unit vectors 1 0 0 etcetera 0 1 0 0 etcetera and finally, 0 0 0 1. So, the basis has been excluded towards the right. The dual simplex method consists of changing a negative basic variable in such a way that the value of the new basis variable in its place would be positive and the relative cost coefficients or the deviations for the changed basis still remains non negative, because that is the condition for optimality. If you remember we must have all the deviation entries non negative. Now, assume that some b j is strictly greater than 0 that is it is not greater than equal to it is strictly greater than 0 that is value of some basic variable are negative and all c j are greater than or equal to 0. For example, let b r be strictly greater than 0. So, that the corresponding basic variable x n plus r is negative. Also, let some coefficient uh, of the coefficient matrix let us say uh, minus a r j be negative. So, a r j is negative let in particular it be called as minus a r p this is strictly less than 0. Now, we may replace x n plus r by let us say x p in the basis by dividing the rth equation by minus a r p and then eliminating x p from all other equations and also from the last row giving the expression for the objective function f in terms of the non basic variables and the deviation entries that is the relative cost coefficients. 
Now, this change should be made very carefully such that no relative cost coefficient becomes negative. This will be so only if the following conditions hold that is C j minus this ratio multiplied by C p is greater than or equal to 0 for all j is equal to 1 to up to n plus m. In other words, uh, this inequality should be satisfied over all those j for which minus a r p is strictly less than 0. That is the minimum over j for this condition uh, holds that is minus a r j is less than 0. Now, this leads to the determination of p. So, we know what is p. The value of the new basic variable x p would be minus b r multiplied by minus a r p and as you know negative multiplied by negative is positive. So, the whole expression will turn out to be positive. If for minus b r less than 0, then there is no minus a r p less than 0 and the problem is infeasible. Now, we may change the basis in this way step by step iteration after iteration such that one basic variable in each iteration till all the basic variables comes to have non negative values. Thus, we shall arrive at a basis which is a feasible solution and which is also an optimal solution as all the relative cost coefficients that is the c j s will be greater than or equal to 0. Now, it may be noted that in this method we move through a set of points which are not primal feasible taking care all the time that the relative cost coefficients or the deviations remain non negative. So, that the moment we arrive at a feasible basis we find ourselves at the feasible optimum basis. Now, in understand in order to understand this procedure let us look at an example. Now, look at this example it says we have the primal as minimization of z is equal to x 1 plus 4 x 2 plus 3 x 4 there is no uh, x 3 term subject to x 1 plus 2 x 2 minus x 3 plus x 4 greater than or equal to 3 and the second constraint is minus 2 x 1 minus x 2 plus 4 x 3 plus x 4 greater than or equal to 2 and all the 4 decision variables x 1, x 2, x 3, x 4 are greater than or equal to 0. Now, the L p in the standard form looks like this, uh, the minimization is the same of the objective function, but subject to the two conditions instead of the greater than 3 and greater than 2, we have to subtract uh, surplus variables in both the equations and the surplus variable in the first equation is called as x 5 and the surplus variable in the second equation is called as x 6. So, we have the two conditions x 1 plus 2 x 2 minus x 3 plus x 4 minus x 5 is equal to 3 and the second condition is minus 2 x 1 minus x 2 plus 4 x 3 
plus x 4 minus x 6 is equal to 2. Of course, all the decision variables x 1 up to x 6 should be greater than or equal to 0. Now, let us multiply both the equations with the negative sign and what do we find? We find that we get a basic variable in both the equations. So, in the first equation we have x 5 as the basic variable and in the second equation we have x 6 as the basic variables because uh, they were negative and since we have multiplied both the equations with the negative sign. Therefore, we get uh, x 5 and x 6 as positive and this canonical form gives us a solution x 5 is equal to minus 3, x 6 is equal to minus 2. Now, you will wonder that how can the values of the right hand side be negative. Yes, that is true. This is what is the beauty about this method that is the basis that is the basic variables they are non they are negative both of them are negative. And uh, of course, all others are 0. So, what is this uh, BFS corresponding to? This BFS is optimum but it is primal infeasible. Why is it infeasible? Because we want that all the x i's should be greater than or equal to 0. But unfortunately, both these variables are negative. So, they are not feasible. They are not primal feasible. That is why they are written to be primal infeasible. Both these variables are primal infeasible and of course, they are dual feasible as we have seen in the explanation that they will be dual feasible because they uh, satisfy the dual constraints. So, they are dual feasible, but they are primal infeasible and they are optimum. So, now let us record all this information in this table. Now, as I said the basis is nothing but x 5 and x 6 and the coefficients of the objective function in the objective function is 0 and 0 corresponding to x 5 and x 6. Uh, in the x 1 column, we will write the entries minus 1 and 2, under x 2 minus 2 and 1, under x 3 1 and minus 4, similarly minus 1 and 1, under x 5 1 0 and under x 6 0 1 and of course, the right hand side is minus 3 and minus 2. On the top row over here, we have to write the coefficients of the objective function corresponding to each of the variables. So, what do we find? Corresponding to x 1, we have 1, x 2, 4, x 3 you remember there was no x 3 term in the objective function. So, it is 0, x 4 is 3 and of course, for x uh, 5 and x 6 the entries are 0. Next, we will calculate the deviation row that is the cost coefficients and they are nothing but as before 1 minus 0 0 multiplied by minus 1 2 and that comes out to be 1 and similarly for the others 4 minus 0 0 multiplied by minus 2 1 that comes out to be 4 similarly 0 3 0 and 0. So, I hope you have understood how the initial table has been prepared. The peculiarity in this table is that the right hand side entries are negative, which is indicating that although this BFS is optimum, but it is infeasible as far as the primal is concerned. Now, we have to change the basis. 
so we need to decide uh, the pivot and we need to decide which variable should enter and which variable should leave. Now, uh, the difference between the simplex method and the dual simplex method is uh, that in the simplex method, we first find the entering variable and then find the leaving variable. However, in the case of the dual simplex method, it is the other way around that is first of all we find the leaving variable that is that variable which has to leave and then we find the entering variable. So, what is the criteria for the leaving variable and the criteria is most negative right hand side. So, if you look at the right hand side what were the two entries let us go back yeah minus 3 and minus 2 you find that uh, minus 3 and minus 2 are the right hand side entries and uh, the most negative is minus 3. Therefore, minus 3 uh, the, co the variable corresponding to minus 3 should be living. So, minus 3 is the living variable and therefore, x 5 that is the variable corresponding to minus 3 that is x 5 that has to leave. So, x 5 leaves the basis that is the first uh, step that has to be taken. Next, we have to look at the criteria for the entering non basic variable into the basis. So, uh, we have to look at the criteria. The criteria is the maximum ratio test has to be performed. Again, uh, if you remember in the simplex method, we perform the minimum ratio test. However, in the dual simplex method, we perform the maximum ratio test and the maximum ratio test has to be performed between the deviation role and only the negative coefficients in the pivot row. So, for the non basic variables. So, what are the uh, those entries? Let us look at it 1 minus 1, let me go back 1 and minus 1 that is corresponding to x 1, similarly corresponding to x 2, 4 and minus 2, 4 and minus 2 that is right and the third one is 3 and minus 1. Now, out of these 3, we have to select the one that is maximum and you can see that the maximum is equal to minus 1. So, what does this indicate? This indicates that x 1 should enter the basis and that is what is to be done. So, from the initial table that is the table number 1, we obtain the table number 2 by applying the elementary row operations in such a way that x 1 uh, variable becomes the basis. Here you can see in the second table uh, under the x 1 column we have the entries 1 and 0 as you know that the elementary row operations have to be performed like this r 1 is replaced by minus r 1 because this entry we have to make as 1 it is minus 1 we have to make it as 1. So, in order to do that we need to multiply r 1 with the negative sign. Secondly, we have to replace the r 2 by r 2 minus 2 r 1. If we do that, then the entry corresponding to the second row under x 1 column becomes 0. Therefore, applying these two elementary row operations, we get the table number 2 which is shown below and after that we need to calculate the deviation entries. So, the deviation entries are to be calculated 
by making sure that in this first column we change the coefficient of the basis. So, the coefficient of basis uh, for x 1 um, variable is 1 and for the x 6 is 0 that will remain as before. And before, uh, just as before we calculate the deviation entries like this 1 minus 1 0 multiplied by 1 0 that is 0. Anyway, this is a basic variable. So, automatically this entry will become 0. Similarly, 4 minus 1 0 multiplied by 2 minus 3 which comes out to be 2 and similarly 0 minus 1 0 multiplied by minus 1 minus 2 which comes out to be 1. Similarly, 3 minus 1 0 multiplied by 1 minus 3 which comes out to be 2 and then 0 minus 1 0 multiplied by minus 1 2 which is 1 and finally, x 6 variable is the basic variable. So, the entry is 0. That is how we have obtained table number 2 from table number 1. Again, the next iteration has to be performed by finding out the most negative right hand side and we find that the most negative right hand side is minus 8 and this corresponds to the basic variable x 6 and this indicates that the basic variable x 6 should leave the basis and we have to now perform the maximum ratio test to determine which variable should enter the basis. So, the maximum ratio test between the deviation row and only the negative coefficients of the non basic variable uh, is in the pivot row is maximization of 2 upon minus 3, 1 upon minus 2, 2 upon minus 3 which comes out to be minus 1 by 2 this has to be the maximum and this indicates that this is corresponding to the variable Therefore, from table number 2, we get table number 3 as follows. Uh, under the x 1 uh, uh, column, we have 1 0 0. So, now this we have to apply the elementary row operations in such a way that r 1 is replaced by r 2 uh, sorry r 2 is replaced by minus r 2 by 2 and r 1 is replaced by r 1 minus r 1 plus r 2 sorry. So, the elementary row operations are applied like this r 2 is replaced by minus r 2 by 2 and r 1 is replaced by r 1 plus r 2. So, therefore, we get uh, table number 3 from table number 2 like this uh, under the x 1 heading we have 1 0 under x 2 we have 7 upon 2 3 upon 2 under x 3 we have 0 1 under x 4 we have 5 by 2 and 3 by 2 x 5 is minus 2 minus 1, x 3 is minus 1 by 2 and minus 1 by 2 and the right hand side is 7 by uh, 7 and 4. Now, you will observe that we will calculate the last row that is the deviation rows. Uh, it is calculated as usual that is 1 minus 1 0 multiplied by 1 0 that is 0. Then the next one is 1 by 2 0, 1 by 2 0 and 
finally 1 by 2. Now, you will find that this is optimum as well as feasible because the right hand side has become greater than 0 and as you know for feasibility it is necessary that the right hand side should be greater than 0 and that is what is happening here that right hand side has become greater than 0. Now, the stopping criteria has to be defined for the dual simplex method and the stopping criteria is that all the right hand sides should be positive as you know that is the requirement for feasibility. And since the stopping criteria has been satisfied in the second iteration itself, therefore, the solution obtained is x 1 is equal to 7 and x 3 is equal to 4 and of course, the objective function value that is z is 7. This is the primal optimum, it is feasible as well as optimum. So, what do we find in the simplex method we move from non optimum to the optimum whereas, in the dual simplex method we move from the primal infeasible to the primal feasible. So, the primal is uh, in the problem that we had was given by the equation x 1 plus 4 x 2 plus 3 x 4 subject to x 1 plus 2 x 2 minus x 3 plus x 4 greater than or equal to 3 minus 2 x 1 minus x 2 plus 4 x 3 plus x 4 greater than or equal to 2 all x i is greater than or equal to 0 and the dual was maximization of 3 y 1 plus 2 y 2 subject to y 1 minus 2 y 2 less than or equal to 1, 2 y 1 minus y 2 less than or equal to 4, minus y 1 plus 4 y 2 less than or equal to 0, y 1 plus y 2 less than or equal to 3 and all the y 1 and the y 2 greater than or equal to 0. Now, we have seen that we have solved this primal okay, and we started with a uh, infeasible primal and we reached at a uh, feasible primal. Now, I have written the dual of this problem and now let us see what happens. If you look at this matrix B that is the basis the column basis that is the p 5 and the p 6. So, what happens is what is b inverse? b inverse is nothing but minus 2 minus 1 minus 1 by 2 minus 1 by 2 and the b bar is nothing but b inverse b which is nothing but this matrix minus 2 minus 1 minus 1 by 2 minus 1 by 2 multiplied by minus 3 minus 2 which comes out to be 7 4. You can just check these calculations. Uh, then the simplex multipliers pi are nothing but pi 1 and pi 2 which is equal to C B B inverse and this is equal to 1 0 multiplied by minus 2 minus 1 minus 1 by 2 minus 1 by 2 and that is nothing but minus 2 and minus 1 by 2. This is the solution of the dual, this is the solution of the dual because as you know that uh, when we uh, find the simplex multipliers from the uh, primal final table, uh, we can read the value of the solution of the dual. So, the actually the simplex multipliers are the solution of the dual. So, this solution minus 2 and minus 1 by 2 is actually the solution of the dual. So, let me go back yeah this is the solution to the dual of this problem you can just check that it should satisfy all the constraints and it should be 
optimum to the dual. So, minus 2 minus 1 by 2 is the uh, simplex multipliers and therefore, they are the solution of the dual. So, in the end let us conclude this lecture with a question which I want you to do at your uh, place. Solve the following LPP by the dual simplex method. So, you have uh, uh, LPP as follows uh, minimization of x 1 plus 2 x 2 plus sorry minimization of x 1 plus 3 x 2 plus 2 x 3 subject to 4 x 1 minus 5 x 2 plus 7 x 3 less than or equal to 8. Second constraint is 2 x 1 minus 4 x 2 plus 2 x 3 greater than or equal to 2 x 1 minus 3 x 2 plus 2 x 3 less than or equal to 2 and of course, x 1, x 2 and x 3 should be all greater than or equal to 0. So, you have to solve this problem with the dual simplex method and uh, I have already uh, told you how to do that. You have to make the initial uh, table with the help of multiplying the uh, those equations where you have added uh, surplus variable or rather subtracted surplus variables. So, that the right hand side becomes negative. The answer to this problem is also given it is 1 0 0 with an objective function value 1. So, I hope you will be able to complete this exercise. Thank you.